good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. We're still in the celebration mood here at Through the Bible, thanks to the glorious truths that we're learning in the Gospel of Luke. Welcome aboard the Bible bus for our continuing journey through the whole Word of God. And in just a moment, our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, will take us through a meaningful study of Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 35. So while you grab your seat and find your place in God's Word, Greg and I have got more great videos to share with you, at least the audio portions of them. Yeah, Steve, it's no secret that our Why I Love the Bible videos and emails have been one of our favorite things to share among our listening family this year. And of course, we are sharing the audio of these videos. So a couple of these, we we will explain some of the unique features. But today we have something quite uh, exciting and different. You see, our global Through the Bible team, that is the partner groups around the world that actually produce Through the Bible in various languages, they, they've gotten in on the fun and they're sharing their videos with us. So this first one... I think people will hear it in the accent, but it is from our Italian team. So let's give that a listen. I do love the Bible because it is true. All that it says is true. Because it's the source of life. I love the Bible because it's hope. Because it's the guide of my life. Man, you just lose so much in this video yeah, because yeah, you don't get to see the the audio because you don't get to see the video. And yeah. they did a really creative thing where each person talks, pops into a different chair, and then did yeah. a freeze frame. And so you see these people moving around the room. It's really cool. It's really fun. Now, our next one is from Marek Szeslar, who is our Polish speaker. Now, it's a little more serious and thoughtful, but listen to the pastoral heart. And remember, this man is teaching Dr. McGee's material to the Polish people. Yep. I love the Bible because as I read this unique book, I feel God's presence and my faith is growing. And I am more and more sure that God is my Father, Jesus loves me, and that I am going to spend with Him the whole eternity. This is the most wonderful and joyful truth. Well, Merrick certainly has a pastor's heart. You can he just does. tell by the way he speaks. He does. And when I when I listened to his video or saw his video, I thought, I'm so glad he's teaching through the Bible yeah. to the, the Polish-speaking people of the world. Now, we have one more, and this one is not in English, but yes. this is a, a member of our uh, Indonesian team who says, uh, we're going to give you the translation, the Bible is the seed of God that has been given to transform my life. So let's just real quickly listen to what she has to say in Bahasa Indonesian. Kenapa saya mencintai Alkitab? Karena firman Allah yang ada dalam Alkitab adalah benih yang diberikan Tuhan untuk mengubah hidup saya. So Steve, isn't that exciting that that people around the world have gotten into this why I yeah. love the Bible? And the thing that always strikes me as I watch, no matter how many of these videos I watch, whether they're from our listening family here in North America or from the, the folks that produce through the Bible around the world, we all love the Bible for the similar reasons. Yeah. You know, it's not like we're speaking about something different. Yep. It's so yeah. true. The Bible speaks so clearly to us and more, the way it comes back. And you say it's all the, you know, we, we all say the same thing, but we also, there's different nuances to yes, what everybody yes. is saying. Yeah. And that is so interesting, the way the Bible speaks to people's hearts in truth, and then people receive it and it, and it impacts their life in a different way. Greg, why don't you pray for us? Father, thank you that we can celebrate that this is a global ministry, that there are people who love your word all over the world, and by your grace and your power, we're helping more people to love it, and we pray you would continue that wonderful work all around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we're in the Gospel of Luke, and I probably should say that if you do not have the notes and outlines, we invite you to write in and ask for them. Now, as I come here to this first chapter, we got through what is known as the introduction, the periodic sentence, the first four verses. Now, you'll notice that Dr. Luke sticks to history, and he has a great deal of historical data, and he fits the Lord Jesus into time. He came out of eternity into time. And John puts it in the lofty language of, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. Now, Dr. Luke will not approach it that way. He happens to be a doctor, a scientist, and also a man highly educated 
in that day and a personal friend of the Apostle Paul. He'll say it, but in just a little bit different language than that. He will fit the Son of God into the history of the world. Now, will you listen to this, beginning with verse 5, chapter 1 of Luke. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Now, this is where God broke in after 400 years of silence. Dr. Luke begins chronologically first in the New Testament. He goes back to the birth of John the Baptist, and he goes back of that to where the angel Gabriel appeared to his father yonder as he served in the temple. Now, the very interesting thing is that we have here two names, Zacharias and we have Elizabeth. Zacharias means God remembers, and Elizabeth means his oath. God remembers his oath. That's a strange thing. Here's a couple, that their very names are very significant. God remembers his oath. Well, when did God take an oath? Oh, way back yonder, you recall God said to David, once have I said to David, and Not only did he say it to David, but he says, I took an oath, and I will not lie, that I'm going to bring one in his line that's going to sit upon his throne. May I say to you, that's a remarkable statement. I'm going to read it. It's in the 89th Psalm, verses 34 and 35. Listen to this. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that's gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne is the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. May I say to you, friends, it says here that Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth, we have God remembers his oath. What is his oath? Why, he took an oath to David that he's going to bring one in his line to reign. Here he's coming, friends. This is just the announcement that he's on the way, that God is ready now to break through into human history after 400 years of silence. Now, will you notice it says they were both righteous before God. That is, they were right with God. How were they right? Well, they were right because they brought the sacrifices that recognized they were sinners. But their walk was also a walk that commended their salvation. Notice what it says. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. That is, when they did make a mistake or sin, they brought the sacrifice. Now, here was the tragedy of their lives, though. They had no child because that Elizabeth was barren and they both were now well stricken in years, old couple, and they didn't have a child. And that was practically a disgrace for a Hebrew woman. And now we find he's serving there at the temple. He belongs to the tribe of Levi. And now let me read on. Verse 8, came to pass that while he executed the priest's office, Before God, in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Now, he served at the golden altar. That's the altar of prayer. And he was serving there. It was the time of the evening sacrifice. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. Now, that particular part of the service, he's putting incense on the altar. There appeared unto him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. And that's a normal reaction, is it not? You saw an angel, what would you do? May I say the the same reaction this man? You'd be troubled and fearful. Now will you notice? But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And you know what he was praying for? Praying for a son. 
You know what his wife was praying for? She's praying for her son. I think a lot of people were praying for that. I believe in asking God's people to pray. I asked God's people to pray for me when I found out that cancer had gotten into my lungs. And people have prayed. I thank God for the prayers of God's people. And so he's in there praying. He's praying for his son. And how do I know he's praying for his son? Because the angel said, your prayer is answered. It's been heard. Thy wife Elizabeth shall bear a son, and thou shalt call his name John. This man, Zacharias, is very much like a lot of us. Thou shall have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. He shall be great in the sight of the Lord. He shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. Now, this boy that's to be born is to be a Nazarite. Now, we'll get that in the next book, back in the book of Numbers, when we go back there. The right of the Nazarite. It was a vow that a man would take. And one of the things that a Nazarite did, he wouldn't drink wine or strong drink. And that was, he's find his joy in the Holy Spirit and in God. That's the reason Paul says, be not drunk with wine. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Get your joy from God, not from a bottle. We got a lot of bottle babies today, let me tell you. And I don't mean in a crib. I mean hanging over a bar stool. And I think we got some Christians today. They have to be pepped up, to hepped up in order to face life today. We need to recognize the Spirit of God can do that for us. Now, will you notice? We read here, And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. He shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. Now, let's understand clearly that John the Baptist went forth in the spirit and power of Elias or Elijah, but he was not Elijah. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, this is to bridge the generation gap. You know, our problem today is not that there's a gap between the adults and the youth. The problem today is between God and the adults. If they had a proper relationship with God, we wouldn't have this problem with those that are the young people today. I'd love to elaborate on that, but I'll not take time today. He shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah. That's important to note. Now, listen to this, and this is hard to understand. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I'm an old man, my wife well stricken in years. And you know, I can't help but laugh at a verse like that. A great many people don't find humor in the Bible, but there's a great deal of it. Here is a man that's gone to God in prayer, and he's a priest. And at the altar incense, he said, Oh, God, give me a son. Now, when God says through the angel Gabriel, I'm going to give you a son, what in the world does this man say? He said, How do I know it? He said, My wife's old and I'm old, and I don't think we can have a child. And yet he was praying for it. You ever pray like that? You really ask God for something and you really don't believe he's going to give it to you, do you? And that's one reason we don't get answers, I think. No faith at all. But this man, Zacharias, he's quite human. I can't help but laugh at him because my feeling is that that's the way I pray sometimes, and I'm sure you pray that way sometimes. We ask God for something, and then when he gives us the answer, we're a little surprised, aren't we? And this man, Zacharias, says, how'll I know it? Well, the angel answering said unto him, I'm Gabriel that stand in the presence of God, and I'm sent to speak unto thee and show thee these glad tidings. May I say to you, the word of God today has the seal of God upon it, and that's the authority of it. It's not what Vernon McGee says. It's what the word of God says that's important. It's what God says. Oh, how important that is. Now, notice this. It says, And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. This man now that's been so vocal to say, How shall he know it? Well, the angel says, You're going to be dumb. And you know, unbelief is always dumb. Never has a message. I think it was Elizabeth Barrett Browning that made some statement about that if you have not faith, keep quiet. It might be well for a lot of these babblers today that are everlastingly spouting off about their unbelief. Well, you haven't anything to say. Why don't you keep quiet? 
Let the man who has something to say believes God. Now will you notice? And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. And I don't know, maybe you don't see this as being funny. I think it's funny. God, after 400 years of silence, he breaks through, and this very man that he communicates with doesn't believe him, and now he's made dumb. And you can imagine him out there trying to explain, how would you explain and make known to people that you'd seen an angel and you couldn't talk? My friend, that's not easy. You think about that for a little, and you think of the gyrations that this man, Zacharias, must have gone through, and I think they were rather comical, by the way. I hope you see it that way, too. Now, will you notice, verse 23, it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. You see, David had arranged the priests to serve at a certain period of time. Then they had a vacation. They served, and then they took time out. And so this is what is happening here, why he had to finish out his term of office and he can't open his mouth. And now that he is given time off, well, he can keep quiet. And I imagine, listen to Elizabeth. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. And this is something quite interesting. Here is this man, Zacharias, he can't talk. And Elizabeth, she's gone off with him to hide herself because this is something that's quite unusual. And don't you imagine she talked his right arm off during that period and said, isn't it wonderful, Zacharias, we're going to have a son. Well, now, will you notice this? We come now to another section. Verse 26, and in the sixth month, that is six months after he appeared to Zacharias. The angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And two times in one verse, she's called a virgin. And you know what a virgin is? May I say to you, there are a great many folk today don't seem to know that a virgin is one that could never have a child in a natural way because of the fact that she has never had a relationship with a man that would make possible the birth of a child. Now, somebody needs to talk rather plainly today because we have these men saying that the virgin birth is a biological miracle. I always feel that when I hear today that statement made, and the parallel statement is, made by certain men. I've heard a preacher here in Southern California say that the Bible does not teach the virgin birth. I've always felt like calling up that man and saying to him, I'd like to have lunch with you, and I want to tell you about the birds and the bees, because you don't seem to know about the birds and the bees, because the Scripture makes it very clear that the Lord Jesus was virgin-born. Now, I do not object to an unbeliever saying he does not believe in the virgin birth. But when he comes along and he makes a statement and says that the Bible does not teach the virgin birth, I have to say to that man, and I say it very plainly, that there's something wrong with your intellect. Or you were not taught about the birds and the bees. For the very simple reason, the Bible makes it very clear that he was virgin-born. Now, will you notice that this is made very clear here? And remember, Dr. Luke gives us the most extended account of the virgin birth. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord's with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Now, there are several things I'd like to say. One is that the tendency among us Protestants is to play down the role of Mary. But remember... She was highly favored, but also with the same breath, let me say, that she is blessed art thou not above women, but among women. She is not lifted up above women. She lifted womanhood up. That is the role that she played. Because you see, 
so easy to say that a woman brought sin into the world. But also, let's also say that a man did not bring the Savior into the world, but a woman did. Now, will you notice? And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. And again, may I say that when the supernatural touches the natural, it always creates fear and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And I can't resist saying this, and I'm sure you'll forgive me for saying it, but it was like a friend of mine in Memphis, Tennessee, years ago that said, you know, he said, I never believe in ghosts either. He says, until I saw one. Well, believe me, friends, when you've seen an angel, you have a right to be afraid. Now, if you haven't seen one, of course, you don't know anything about this. And I haven't seen one. I know nothing about it, but I think I'd be afraid if I did see one. Now, the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, shall call his name Jesus. Now, this is very plain language, don't you think? I think it's very plain. No way of misinterpreting it. He shall be great, and shall be called a son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. You see, all of this is quite literal. These folk who've denied the virgin birth also do not think he's going to sit on the throne of his father David. But apparently, it was understood that everything here was literal. The virgin's womb was literal, and the throne of David is literal. He shall reign over the house of Jacob, and that's literal, forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. And that kingdom is a reality. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And you know, she was the first one that questioned the virgin birth. <laughs> she said, How can it be? And it's still a good question, by the way. And the answer is given by Dr. Luke here, and he's quoting the angel Gabriel. Verse 35, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. You see, no man had anything to do with the birth of Jesus. Therefore, also that holy thing. Let's understand that, that that holy thing. Now, back in the book of Leviticus, we saw that the birth of a child caused a woman to be unclean. Why? Well, because she brought a sinner into the world. But now, Dr. Luke makes it clear here, quoting the angel. The angel says, that's not a sinner you're bringing into the world. And this is the only way that you could get that holy thing into the world, my friend. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Well, not Mary. This is different, you see. This is the virgin birth. Now, you can deny the virgin birth if you want to. If you're an unbeliever, I expect you to. And don't you write and tell me that you believe the virgin birth and deny the Bible. My friend, you would upset me terribly if you made a statement like that. I know you don't believe the virgin birth if you're not a Christian. But don't come along and tell me now that the Bible doesn't teach the virgin birth. You just haven't met Dr. Luke, I'm afraid. Now, will you notice? That holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And you know why he's going to be called the Son of God? Because he is the Son of God. Now, remember that Dr. Luke puts an emphasis here that is the scientific approach. He states that he examined Jesus of Nazareth, and his findings are that Jesus is God. Now, he came to the same conclusion as John did, but his procedure and his technique were different, you see. My, how marvelous and how wonderful this gospel is. We'll have to leave off there today, but with no hurry, I'm going to pick up right at verse 36 next time and we'll move along in this wonderful record that God has given us. So until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Dr. McGee mentioned the notes and outlines in our study today, and you can download them in our digital book, Briefing the Bible, anytime at ttb.org. Or if you want to get a copy that's a little bit abbreviated by mail, you can do that too by calling us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. And you can always write to us at Box 7100, 
Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Well, I'm Steve Schwetz. So looking forward to a great week together with you in God's Word. See you next time. We're grateful for our committed listening family who faithfully pray and invest in Through the Bible as we together take the whole word to the whole world.